Welcome to this compilation of five winsome and wistful sci-fi short stories. I'm William Skye, and I'll be narrating Star of Rebirth by Bernard Wall, Song in a Minor Key by C. L. Moore, Heavenly Gifts by Aaron L. Colom, The First Day of Spring by Mary Wolf, and The Pure Observers by B. J. Rogers. If you find yourself enjoying the stories, consider checking out my Patreon to support the channel and get great perks like novelettes from the great authors. The most recent one is Ribbon in the Sky by Murray Leinster. If you're interested, head to patreon.com forward slash stories from the sky sff, link in the description. But for now, let's get to the stories, so sit back, relax, and enjoy. Star of Rebirth by Bernard Wall Narrated by William Skye Atanta knew the Red Star was the home of his people after death, and for months now it had been growing brighter. Everyone should have known. They should have known as surely as though it were written in the curved palm of the wind. They should have known when they looked up at the empty sky. They should have known when they looked down at the hungry children. Yet somehow they did not know that their last migratory hunt was almost over. The straggling band had woven its slow trail among the mountains for forty days of vanishing hopes and shrinking stomachs. Ahead of the main party, the scouts had crawled until their knees and palms were raw, but still there was no track of game, and the only scent was that of the pungent air that rose from the ragged peaks of ice. At last they halted, only a few footsteps from the cave of the fallen sun, the farthest western reach of their frozen domain. In the rear of the column, the women threatened the children into silence, and the scouts went first to the mouth of the cave to look for signs of an animal having entered. Presently, the scouts stood up with their massive shoulders drooping, turned to the rest, and made a hopeless gesture. Atanta, who stood alone and motionless between the scouts and the rest of his band, knew that all were waiting for him to use his magic to make a great leopard appear in the empty cave. A very great leopard, he thought sarcastically enough to feed them all for a hundred days. A leopard so huge it would whine pitifully while they killed it. A leopard so gigantic that it would not leave its footprints in the snow. Indeed, Atanta was sure, the leopard his people wanted would be much too large to fit into the cave. Well, perhaps there would be a bird. He held himself very tall and straight, so that his dejection might not show to either his people or his gods. But after forty days of the trackless hunt, Atanta felt with certainty that the gods were deaf or dead, or at least very far away. The sun was hot, and the gods were gone, and he would not keep his people waiting with false hopes. He closed his eyes and took up the crude bone cross that hung from his waist, and he cursed the gods with silent venom and when his chastisement of the delinquent gods was done, he dropped the cross to dangle at his waist again. Two hunters moved stealthily forward, their spears disappearing before them into the cave. It was somehow pathetic, Atanta felt, the way they moved so courageously into the empty darkness. How many caves had there been, Atanta wondered, since they left the mouth of the river? Fully a dozen, always empty, except for the scattered bones of bears and men. Perhaps he should have kept his people at the river. No, he told himself. He had done the only thing he could do. The season had been bad, and their meagre catch of fish carefully stored. But the already heavy ice thickened with the approach of winter, and made fishing almost impossible. When their supplies were almost gone, he had done as so many had done before him. He had led his people on the futile hunt, hoping for the miracle of a dozen sleeping bears or a great white leopard. Such miracles had happened in the past. Once he had gone with his father on such a winter hunt. But miracles without footprints were quite another matter. That was the way his people lived, just existing when the catch was good, starving when it was not. Presently the two hunters stepped out of the darkness with the blunt ends of their spears dragging behind them, 
and their countenances told the others that the cave was indeed empty. Children began to cry. Women picked up their packs and slung them across their shoulders. The men mumbled inaudible words that turned into wisps of smoke in the icy air. At Atanta's signal, everyone entered the ice-floored cave, thankful at least to be out of the blinding brightness of the sun and snow, and into the soothing dark where they could rest. Atanta stood while his people stretched their furry bodies out over the frozen ground. He looked down at his woman who lay before him, watching him with her black eyes large and warm. It made his stomach clutch itself into an angry knot to see her young face so drawn with exhaustion and hunger. There were lines in her face he had never seen before. The fur of her head and body had lost its sheen and was now brittle and dry. She patted the ice and motioned him to lie down beside her, but he turned his eyes away from her because he knew that he must tell the others before he could rest. Listen to me, he said, and his voice rang through the ice-sheeted cave. The tired eyes of the men and women opened, and everyone sat up. How should he tell them? They were waiting now. Should he simply say it swiftly and have done with it? Tell them that they had followed an impotent god until now they were to die. Surely he should prepare them somehow. Prepare them for the importance of what he was to say. Listen, for I tell you of the end of the empty caves. He stood silent for a moment, watching hope filter into their faces, hope that made their dull eyes shine in the semi-darkness. Do not let joy curl your lips until you have listened, for it would be a false joy. The lines of tiredness and worry returned to the faces about him. Atanta did not look down at his woman's face, for she knew him very well, and she would know what he had to do. We are told of a time long ago, when the cave of man was filled with food as the night is filled with stars, and the caves and the men covered the five corners of the world. But these were not the caves that we know now. They were magic caves, and these were magic men. The men of that long ago world created the very mountains into which they dug their caves. The mountains they created raised their peaks through the highest clouds, and every mountain held countless caves, caves stuffed with bear and fish and captive winter winds. These were magic times when every man was a priest. Every man could make fire blossom from nowhere, and every man could fly through the air like a bird. All this was long ago, when the world was young, and the world was hot, and our people could live in the heat. But Nuomo, the god of night, became jealous of these magic men, for he had seen them fly into the night itself in search of the stars. And so Nuomo wrapped his black wings around the world and shook it for ten tens of days. The world cracked and burst with flame that sprouted up into the darkened sky. The people ran in terror, and their mountain caves were sucked down into the earth or burned into ash by the flame. At the end of the ten tens of days, Nuomo thought that all were dead, and so he rolled a sheet of ice across the earth to cool it. Only one man was able to escape the wrath of that ancient god. He was an old man, with only little magic, and he felt himself on the edge of death. He took from his body a rib, which he fashioned into a sun. But he made the sun in such a way that he could live upon the ice itself, as we do now. The sun knew that the old man was about to die, and so he said, Father, use your magic to make a woman to keep me from being lonely. Woman, the old man cried. I should think you would want me to teach you the use of magic. Yes, father, the son answered, if you can. No the old man told him. I am so near to death there is no time. A woman will have to do. And so the old man drew from his chest another rib, which he fashioned into a woman. This being done, he turned to his son and said, My son, the time has come for me to die. Do not mourn for me, for when each evening comes you will see my home, the red star which travels quickly in the night. For many ten tens of years, I have been preparing it to become a suitable place to be born again. When your time comes, you too will be welcome there. Thus saying, 
The old man placed his hands upon the shoulders of his son. Then he wrapped his cloak about him and rose up into the heavens to the star of rebirth. Only when the old man had gone to the star of rebirth did the son turn to his woman. Only then did he see that she had not been made in his image, for she was hairless and delicate, and not made to live upon the ice. She was a hotland woman. But the son, whose name was Dektar, took his woman, whose name was Sontia, shielded her from the icy winds, and comforted her as best he could. Some of their children had hair and loved the cold, some were weak and hairless and did not. In those days the hunting was good, and the strong sheltered the weak, fed them, carried them on the long hunts. But Sontia was a jealous woman, jealous of her strong husband and their offspring of his kind. She prayed to Ram, god of the sun, and begged him to melt the ice. And so the ice began to melt, leaving the hotlands a paradise for weak, selfish creatures. Sontia deserted Dektar, taking with her those of their children who were hairless and weak like herself. When the ice began to melt, we sons of Dektar were forced to hunt farther northward year by year. The game became not so plentiful as it had been. Our people learned to fish and hunt as we do now, to fish in the summer, to hunt when the ice becomes thick. But the jealous sons of Sontia who swarm in the hotlands were not content to see us perish year by year. Even to this day, if we should wander down to the edge of their domain to beg for a few scraps of food, they would answer our plea with death. And even in death they would allow us no dignity, but would strip us of our hides and wear them in mockery. I tell you of this now because when a man comes on a long hunt which ends in an empty cave, it is well to remember and be proud of the successful hunts of other years. Atanta took the white bone cross carefully from about his waist. It was I who first saw this god go across the sky. He held up the cross for all to see. It went slowly like a bird from horizon to horizon, and I knew that it was not a bird, for it did not flap its wings, but kept them still and outstretched. I believed it to be the god who would fill our hunting trails with game, but now I know that this god is impotent. At worst it is a foolish god, lying somewhere on the white floating ice of heaven, wallowing in idleness while my people starve. He dropped the cross to the smooth ice floor, knelt, and smashed the cross into pieces with one swift blow of his hammer stone. When he looked up, the people were silent and unmoving. Perhaps he had been a fool. Perhaps he had told them nothing they didn't know. Perhaps they had already given up, and knew that they would die here in the cave, and that he could produce no magic to help them. Will you take another god? one of the scouts asked. I see no other god to take. Then do you think we can be delivered without a god? Wasn't it evident? Surely they must know. Should he tell them there was no deliverance, with or without a god? I don't know, he lied. I don't know. Ark's woman drew a strip of leather from the mouth of a sleeping child and put it in her own mouth. Then you'll have to deliver us yourself, she said, and lay down to go to sleep. A sudden rage burned in Atanta's brain. The muscles in his square jaw trembled as he glared at the sprawling furry figures, who would lie there and die while they waited like children for him to provide for the future. Abruptly, he turned and left the cave, and walked out under the yellow sun that made the ice-covered mountains shimmer. He felt that he must get away from them. He did not want to die with fools. The sun blazed hot upon the hair of his head and back as he travelled rapidly downward and away from his people in the cave. He travelled too quickly to think of anything else but where his next footstep should be, and within an hour he was at the edge of a great ice field that stretched itself out before him like the footprint of a giant. There could be no more swift travelling now. Cautiously, he started out over the empty plain, prodding the ice before him with his spear. It was not that they were children. He knew that he had been wrong to judge them so. There was nothing they could do. They had walked their lives away on the long hunt that ended now without a sign or scent of prey. And he, Atanta, had led them. They were strong and loyal people, too, 
for if he ordered them up and back along the trail that they had come, each man would go without a word and hope that there was some magic Atanta had yet to use. But the animals were gone, and the gods were gone, and there was but one thing left. He would go down below this range where the hotlanders were known to be. Probably he would simply die in the sun. If not, the hotlanders would kill him on the spot, as they were usually so quick to do. The hotlanders had good magic. Not as good as his ancestors, Atanta was sure. But still, they could kill a man from a great distance simply by pointing a magic charm and making a certain noise. Perhaps the hotlanders wouldn't see him, and perhaps he would not die in the sun. Perhaps he would find some game by the edge of the hotlands. Perhaps. The sun had tucked itself behind a white western peak when Atanta at last came to the end of the ice field. Tired now, he crouched for a moment like a bird with his bottom sitting squarely upon his heels. Presently his tiredness became true exhaustion, so he dug himself a little space in a shadowed snow bank and then covered himself with a mound of snow. While Atanta slept, a great lost bird came on the last feeble rays of light, flapping its black wings, because there was no wind to glide upon, and there was no footing but the frozen ground. When above Atanta, the bird caught a slight scent in the air, held its wings stiff, and tilted itself to glide in slow circles that became smaller and smaller, and ever lower, until at last the bird's tired feet sank deep into the snow beside the mound where Atanta lay. The bird folded its wings about itself and pecked at the mound, its beak digging cautious holes in the snow. Atanta stirred slightly at this intrusion, and the bird drew its beak away and flapped its wings against the windless air and flew away. When Atanta woke, the night wind had curled itself with a scream about the mountains and brought with it a fresh snow. He dug himself from his bed and smiled with his eyes closed at the night that sent the wind and snow to caress his hair. When he opened his eyes, his face was tilted upward to the sky, and he smiled at the lonely stars. The moon was full and heavy tonight, and it hung low in the western sky. Atanta wished his woman could be here beside him, nestling close to him in the soft snow, her delicate hands caressing the hair on his cheek. He thought of her hands rubbed raw from the straps of the heavy pack. Perhaps it was better that he had left without saying goodbye. He felt rested enough to go on, and was about to hoist himself to his feet when the red star caught his attention. For months now it had been growing brighter with every night that passed, as if heralding some important event. This was the red star of rebirth and he wished he could believe that he and his people would some day go to live there, but he no longer believed in anything. It was then that Atanta saw the god. It was a great and fearful god that turned the black night yellow and screamed louder than the wind. In an instant it fell out of the sky, then the yellow light was gone, and the voice of the god was gone, and the dark night returned, and the voice of the wind returned. Atanta fell to his knees and his trembling hand etched out the sign of the cross in the snow. Surely this must be a sign. The god had come out of the sky and fallen in the path before him, forbidding him to go into the lowlands. He knew he must pray and ask forgiveness, but for many moments he was too frightened to pray, and when the fear subsided, he was too proud. Why should he pray to a god who would let his people starve? He raised his eyes and saw the very head of the god peering up above the next rise. He stood up with a semblance of dignity on his unsteady legs. When the god did not move from behind the rise for many minutes, Atanta's courage overbalanced his fear, and he kicked the snow with his foot and obliterated the sign of the cross. He waited for the god to strike him dead, but nothing happened. The head of the god was motionless. Atanta set out with cautious steps. Presently, he hid behind a little ice dune where he could see the god in its awesome entirety. Now he was close enough to hurl his spear at it if the god suddenly struck in anger, and he gripped the spear in readiness. 
Suddenly he was filled with a new awe, for he realized that this was not the god of the cross. There were no stiff wings at its side. It was like a huge shining spear with its dull end stuck in the snow and its point stretching up to the sky. But how could this be a god? Perhaps he should not yet pray. Time had shown there were many false gods. Presently, a black mouth appeared magically in the side of the great still thing. The mouth sucked in the icy air for a moment, and then extended a long jagged tongue down to the fresh snow. Atanta saw something move in the blackness of the gaping mouth, and then a figure stepped out onto the tongue, and looked about at the falling snow and the white jagged mountains in the darkness. It was the figure of a man. At least it was in a man's shape, but it did not look like a man of the mountains, nor did it look like the man-creatures of the hotlands. It walked slowly and laboriously down the tongue, and it seemed to be made of the same shiny stuff as the tongue and the flying wingless god itself. For a moment, Atanta wondered which was the god. The great huge thing with the mouth and the tongue, or the man-thing? The stranger stepped off the tongue into the snow, where he knelt and scooped up the snow in his arms, tossed it into the wind which held it to the ground again. Then he stood and clutched his head. For a moment Atanta thought he had taken his own head off, but then he could tell that he had taken a covering off his head, which he tossed into the snow. Then it seemed that the man had been entirely covered, like the men of the hotlands who wore furs. Presently the man had taken off all his covering and stretched his furry arms up to feel the sweetness of the wind. Atanta leaped up, shouting his surprise. For this was a true man. For a moment the man was startled, and then his face filled with joy. Showing his empty palms, he began to walk slowly toward Atanta. Atanta moved to meet him, the dark fur of his shoulders glistening in the moonlight. He spoke but the man did not understand. Then he pointed up to the sky, then to the man, and tilted his head questioningly. The man smiled and nodded his head. He pointed to the sky, but not straight up. He pointed to a spot low in the west. He pointed to the star of rebirth. While Atanta watched in unbelieving awe, the man touched his own chest, then stooped to lay his palms on the snow at his feet. Then he pointed once more to the red star and made a rapid upward gesture. Then he laid his closed hands beside his head and pretended to be asleep. His fingers opened and closed again and again. Many sleeps, said Atanta, understanding. Tens of ten sleeps. Smiling, the man straightened and made a rapid downward gesture, ending with his palms again on the snow. Then he stepped forward, placing one hand on his chest, the other on Atanta's. The two furry men stood as tall and straight as their dignity could make them, and their faces were bright with joy. Then Atanta took the hammer stone out of the binding about his waist and tossed it into the snow. The man nodded. Stepping back, he lifted his hand in an arc across the sky and offered Atanta the stars. Song in a Minor Key by C. L. Moore Narrated by William Skye Beneath him the clovered hill slope was warm in the sun. Northwest Smith moved his shoulders against the earth and closed his eyes, breathing so deeply that the gun holstered upon his chest drew tight against its strap as he drank the fragrance of earth and clover warm in the sun. Here in the hollow of the hills, willow-shaded, pillowed upon clover and the lap of earth, he let his breath run out in a long sigh, and drew one palm across the grass in a caress like a lover's. He had been promising himself this moment for how long? How many months and years on alien worlds? He would not think of it now. He would not remember the dark spaceways or the red slag of Martian drylands, or the pearl-grey days on Venus when he had dreamed of the earth that had outlawed him. So he lay with his eyes closed and the sunlight drenching him through, 
no sound in his ears but the passage of a breeze through the grass and a creaking of some insect nearby, the violent blood-smelling years behind him might never have been. Except for the gun pressed into his ribs between his chest and the clovered earth, he might be a boy again, years upon years ago, long before he had broken his first law or killed his first man. No one else alive now knew who that boy had been. Not even the all-knowing patrol. Not even Venusian Yarrow, who had been his closest friend for so many riotous years. No one would ever know, now. Not his name, which had not always been Smith, or his native land, or the home that bred him, or the first violent deed that had sent him down the devious paths which led here. Here to the clover hollow in the hills of an earth that had forbidden him ever to set foot again upon her soil. He unclasped the hands behind his head and rolled over to lay a scarred cheek on his arm, smiling to himself. Well, here was earth beneath him. No longer a green star high in alien skies, but warm soil, new clover so near his face he could seal the little stems and trefoil leaves, moist earth granular at their roots. An ant ran by with waving antennae close behind his cheek. He closed his eyes and drew another deep breath. Better not even look. Better to lie here like an animal, absorbing the sun and the feel of earth blindly, wordlessly. Now he was not Northwest Smith, scarred outlaw of the spaceways. Now he was a boy again, with all his life before him. There would be a white-columned house just over the hill, with shaded porches and white curtains blowing in the breeze, and the sound of sweet, familiar voices indoors. There would be a girl with hair like poured honey hesitating just inside the door, lifting her eyes to him. Tears in the eyes. He lay very still, remembering. Curious how vividly it all came back, though the house had been ashes for nearly twenty years, and the girl, the girl. He rolled over violently, opening his eyes. No use remembering her. There had been that fatal flaw in him from the very first, he knew now. If he were the boy again, knowing all he knew today, still the flaw would be there, and sooner or later the same thing must have happened that had happened twenty years ago. He had been born for a wilder age, when men took what they wanted and held what they could without respect for law. Obedience was not in him, and so... As vividly as on that day it happened, he felt the same old surge of anger and despair twenty years old now. Felt the ray gun bucking hard against his unaccustomed fist. Heard the hiss of its deadly charge ravening into a face he hated. He could not be sorry, even now, for that first man he had killed but in the smoke of that killing had gone up the columned house and the future he might have had, the boy himself, lost as Atlantis now, and the girl with the honey-coloured hair and much, much else besides. It had to happen, he knew. He being the boy he was, it had to happen. Even if he could go back and start all over, the tale would be the same. And it was all long past now, anyhow, and nobody remembered any more at all, except himself. A man would be a fool to lie here thinking about it any longer. Smith grunted and sat up, shrugging the gun into place against his ribs. Heavenly Gifts by Aaron L. Colom Narrated by William Skye Heartfelt prayers deserve an answer. But it may be in a peculiar way. A blur of silent motion tugged suddenly at the corner of Mrs. Frisbee's eye. She looked up from her knitting. An electric blanket, deep blue with satiny edges, was materialising, neatly folded, in the centre of her tiny kitchen table. She closed her eyes briefly for a silent prayer of thanks. At midnight she would send out those thanks, followed by a request for a bicycle for the paper boy. Contentedly she raised herself from the chair. She weighed mentally whether there was time to wrap the blanket as a gift before she had to leave for work. She decided against it. It wasn't as if it were an anniversary or birthday present. It was just something she knew her nice landlady, Mrs. Upjohn, needed but couldn't afford. Mrs. Upjohn was in her room. With an embarrassed dismissal of thanks, Mrs. Frisbee presented the blanket to her, then hurried to catch the bus at the corner. The corridor clock showed a few minutes to midnight as Mrs. Frisbee, carrying her mop and pail, entered the control room. 
At the slight noise, Dr. Morrow looked up from his paper-littered desk. A vague smile and wave were directed generally in her direction. With a glance at his watch, he sighed and returned to his work. Mrs. Frisby waited patiently and quietly. A few minutes later, Dr. Morrow looked up again, then yawned and stretched luxuriously. Time for lunch, I guess. He stood up, setting a few dials on the glistening control panel before him. See you in forty-five minutes, he called cheerily. With the sound of his heels echoing down the hall, Mrs. Frisby gingerly sat down in his chair. Taking a sheet of paper from her apron, she meticulously marked down the dial settings exactly as he had left them. Except for the diminishing sound of footsteps, the laboratory building was silent, with the unique quiet of a deserted structure. Through the window she could see the gigantic antenna aiming toward the stars. As always, she experienced a momentary thrill of combined excitement and reverential awe. She waited till she heard the closing of the front door of the building. Then, with practiced fingers, she flipped some switches. The equipment hummed quietly. She swung toward the keyboard and began picking out letters with her forefingers. Finally, she took a page from a mail-order catalogue from her purse and slowly typed out the catalogue numbers. She didn't hurry. Dr. Morrow would now be finishing his lunch in his car. Afterwards, he would take a stroll around the laboratory grounds. He was a man of regular, dependable habit. It had all begun one evening, about five months before, when Mrs. Frisby had attended a revivalist meeting. Simple soul that she was, with her increasing years and the passing of many of her friends, Mrs. Frisby had begun to experience a desire to make peace with her maker. You are all sinners, the preacher had thundered, and you need the most powerful voice in the world to speak for you. It made quite an impression. It seemed the hand of providence when Mrs. Frisby learned that a newly completed astronomical radio station was seeking janitorial personnel. She quickly applied and was hired. It was at first only a vague germ of an idea. Slowly the idea crystallized as she inquired of the technicians just how it was operated. It wasn't really difficult, she learned. An electronic typewriter was used, converting letters and words into mathematical language, then automatically beaming the data out into the vastness of space. It took time, but she even learned what dials and switches to operate so there would be no record of her messages. The station had been established to try to contact intelligences on other planets or star systems. An idiotic waste, the critics complained. Mrs. Frisby agreed. Except for occasional space static, nothing had ever been received. Mrs. Frisby knew this from hearing the men talk. Still, they kept trying, constantly listening, and at regular intervals transmitting basic mathematics recognisable by any civilization. She had arranged her work so that her midnight break came when she was cleaning the control room. There was only a single scientist on night duty, currently Dr. Morrow, who left the equipment on automatic reception while on his lunch break. Mrs. Frisby never needed but half the time he was gone. Her first prayer had been a brief one. Gripped with religious fervour, Mrs. Frisby had typed awkwardly, one finger at a time. The whirring of the equipment as it transmitted her words of devotion out to the farthest reaches of space was as balm to her soul. It was a month later that she decided to test her contact with the Divine with a simple request, an apron she had seen in a catalogue. It would be an ideal birthday present for Mrs. Upjohn, she thought. Days and weeks passed, and Mrs. Frisby had almost lost faith, when suddenly, one evening, as she was quietly sewing, the apron appeared, bright and gay, on her small table. She rubbed her eyes. It was truly wondrous. The thanks she gave in that evening's message were profuse. As time passed, she asked for other items from the catalogue for gifts for other friends. All were delivered miraculously after a few days. Mrs. Frisby was at peace, with the world, with herself, and with her maker. Her simple life was full. She had a proven faith, with miracles occurring as she desired them. There was no end to the people she met who needed things, 
and seemingly no difficulty in having her requests fulfilled. Quite often she was tempted to explain it all to her good friend Mrs. Upjohn, but something always kept her from telling, a feeling that it might be sacrilegious somehow to discuss it. Only one thing occasionally puzzled Mrs. Frisby. Though she always ordered the presents from the mail-order catalogue, they seemed superior in quality and workmanship to any purchased articles. The barracks room language coming from General Collins' office caused his aide to raise his eyebrows. He hadn't heard the general use such terms since Korea. General Collin was even more incredulous than the colonel, the major and the captain had been before him, as each was told. It's impossible, he exploded into the telephone. When did you blankety idiots first discover it? After a brief pause, he barked, Double the guard! A moment later, he barked again. Damn it, then triple it! He sat back stunned. What would the chief say? He shuddered at the thought. His eyes narrowed reflectively, and after a moment he reached again for the phone. Have you contacted any other bases? His voice was now quiet and low. After a brief pause, he added, Come to my office as soon as possible with everything you have on the situation. He steeled himself for the next call, reluctantly reaching for the special red telephone. His orderly mind presented the facts he had learned as clearly as possible. I don't know, he answered a question. No, sir, I haven't contacted AEC or State yet. I'd like to check on it further. Then finally, Complete secrecy, yes, sir. I'm making a thorough security check. An undercurrent of frantic excitement quickly engulfed Washington's top councils, involving even the President. The National Security Council and Chiefs of Staff were called into emergency session. Grim-visaged, star-shouldered officers hurried through Pentagon corridors. Newsmen knew only that something quite serious was taking place, something that vitally affected the national security. Whispers of a secret Russian weapon began to be heard. From the Pentagon, orders went out to every military base. CIA agents and military scientists were hurriedly called, were asked enigmatic questions and were given grim instructions. A few days later, a call came again to General Colin. He had half expected it. He reached again for the red phone. It's happened again! He bit off his words in his exasperation. Yes, right in front of a television monitor. The film is being rushed to Washington. He listened a moment, then nodded. That's right, just disappeared. Completely dematerialized. He received a bit of shock in turn. Two other bases also? Good God. Then, yes sir, I'll fly in tonight. At the top-level meeting the next morning, the Under Secretary of State interrupted the discussion. We have just received a peculiar message from the British Embassy, he said. They are asking about the security of... He lowered his voice, even though the room was soundproof. Everyone about the table looked soberly at each other. Security Council meetings became continuous around-the-clock sessions. The top civilian scientists of the country were brought in and the situation explained to them. As one, they shook their heads. A Nobel Prize winner in physics put it flatly, It is beyond our comprehension, far beyond the state of our knowledge. Central Intelligence reported daily on the political and scientific activities in key spots of the world. A spurt of high-level meetings in Moscow was noticed and duly reported. This ominous news was received with a depression bordering on hysteria. We have underestimated their technological advancement again, said the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. We must increase our production efforts. We must solve this puzzle. He spoke slowly, in measured tones of the utmost gravity. Even at the expense of all other research efforts. This must have the highest possible priority. Orders to this effect were quickly issued. I don't understand the Soviet mind, puzzled the Secretary of State. At the diplomatic level, they are seemingly going farther than ever before in making concessions and overtures toward peace. 
And while they try to lull us politically, fumed the Secretary of Defense, they are leaving us practically defenseless with their scientific thievery. He slammed the table with his fist. We must be on our guard. We must increase our research efforts. And SAC must be placed on an emergency alert, ready for instant retaliation. And each day, despite the frenzied increase in mining and refining activity, a report on the dwindling military capabilities of the United States was given the President. The day finally arrived when he gravely addressed the Security Council. As of today, the President said, we are unable adequately to defend our country. Our production capabilities cannot keep up with what we are losing. We are left only with our conventional weapons. He paused. God help us, we are at their mercy. A worried-looking undersecretary rushed into the council chamber and whispered something into the president's ear. The president's face grew white. He rose slowly. Gentlemen, his quiet voice reflected a rigid control. Mr. Khrushchev is placing a personal call to me on a matter which he says is of the utmost urgency. He paused. Please wait until I return. The group of men carrying on their shoulders the responsibility of the defense of the United States of America and all the free world sat in quiet dejection, heads bowed. Long minutes passed. No one felt up to meeting the eyes of anyone else about the table. As the President re-entered the chamber, the members of the Security Council rose. The atmosphere was heavy with foreboding. He spoke slowly and clearly, his face expressionless. Mr. Khrushchev says he desires to establish a true peace with us. He will agree to all our terms, complete inspection, atomic test ban, disarmament, anything of a reasonable nature. He looked around the shocked room. Relief, puzzlement, suspicion were mirrored on various faces. I'm sure I don't understand all this, the President continued. I doubt if any of you do. But if the Soviet Union is sincere in desiring a true peace, his voice became very quiet, we shall certainly meet them halfway. Ver looked up from the account book with a grunt of approval, then reached for the drink his partner held out. Well, Ty said, didn't I tell you business would be good this period? Ver nodded and downed his drink. Excellent, but I see that most of our profit came from native trade. His eyes narrowed. It looks illegal. Are you supplying arms for a revolution somewhere? Ty's smile became contemptuous. No, it's just local products, native trivia. We drop-shooted survey robots, then called them back and installed a delivery system. The robot picks up samples by dematerialization, and I synthesize them. But so much profit! Aren't there any complaints? Ty laughed. On the contrary, I get thanked after each delivery, plus a request for something else. Natives are the same everywhere. Just suckers waiting to be trimmed. I don't want to get into any trouble over this. Ver looked dubious. Ty refilled the glasses. Well, our business charter says we must fill and deliver any legitimate order we get. If it's legitimate. Ver studied the deep ruby of his drink. Which of our colonies is it? Ty hesitated slightly. It's not one of our colonies. The orders are from subsystem CQ. What? Ver's eyes flashed. You know we're not supposed to have any contact at all with them. They're under official observation. Don't worry, don't worry. Ty's voice exuded confidence. No one can prove we've broken a single law. I don't understand. Ty's expression was one of exaggerated innocence. Everything is automatic. Radio orders for goods are received, translated, and filled with robot delivery. He winked at his partner. How can anyone prove I ever bothered to check the source? But the profit? What do you trade? Aha! I was waiting for you to ask that. 
I set the robot to detect and take a unit of energy metal each trip. Energy metal? Ver jerked upright. Yes, but they're running out, Ty sighed. The robot reports he has had to go clear to the other side of the planet to fill his quota. There's only enough scattered around for a few more trips. I guess we can't complain, Ver said. They clinked their glasses. If you're enjoying the stories, hit the like button to support the channel. Thanks. The First Day of Spring by Mary Wolf, Narrated by William Skye The first day of spring, the man at the weather tower had said, and certainly it felt like spring, with the cool breeze blowing lightly about her, and a faint new clover smell borne in from the east. Spring. That meant they would make the days longer now, and the nights shorter, and they would warm the whole world until it was summer again. Trina laughed aloud at the thought of summer, with its picnics and languid swims in the refilled lakes, with its music and the heavy scent of flowers, and the visitors in from space for the festival. She laughed and urged her horse faster, out of its ambling walk into a trot, a canter, until the wind streamed about her, blowing back her hair, bringing tears to her eyes as she rode homeward toward the eastern horizon, the horizon that looked so far away, but wasn't really. "'Trina!' His voice was very close, and it was familiar, though for a moment she couldn't imagine who it might be. "'Where are you?' She had reined the horse in abruptly, and now looked around her, in all directions, toward the north and south and east and west, toward the farmhouses of the neighbouring village, toward the light tower and the sun tower. She saw no one. No one else rode this early in the day in the pasture part of the world. I'm up here, Trina! She looked up then, and saw him, hovering some thirty feet off the ground in the ridiculous windmill-like craft he and his people used when they visited the world. Oh, hello, Max. No wonder she had known the voice. Max Kramer, down from space, down to the world, to see her. She knew, even before he dropped his craft onto the grass beside her, that he had come to see her. He couldn't have been on the world for more than the hour she'd been riding. You're visiting us early this year, Max. It's not festival time for three months yet. I know. He cut the power to the windmill blades and they slowed, becoming sharply visible. The horse snorted and backed away. Max smiled. This world is very attractive. His eyes caught hers, held them. She smiled back, wishing for the hundredth time since last summer's festival that he were one of her people, or at least a worldling, and not a man with the too white skin of space. It may be attractive, she said, but you always leave it soon enough. He nodded. It's too confining. It's all right for a little while, but then... How can you say that? She shook her head sadly. Already they were arguing the same old unresolvable argument, and they had scarcely greeted each other. After all his months in space, they met with the same words as they had parted. She looked past him, up and out, toward the horizon that seemed so many miles away, toward the morning sun that seemed to hang far, far off in the vaulted blue dome of the sky. How can you even think it? About this? His lips tightened. About this, he repeated. A horizon you could ride to in five minutes. A world you could ride around in two hours. A sun, you really call it a sun, that you could almost reach up and pluck out of that sky of yours. He laughed. Illusions. World of illusions. Well, what do you have? A ship. A tiny ship you can't get out of, with walls you can see, all around you. Yes, Trina. With walls we can see. He was still smiling, watching her, and she knew that he desired her, and she desired him. But not the stars. You have nothing like this, she said, knowing it wouldn't do any good. She looked past him at the light tower, one of the many that formed the protective screen about her world, 
that made it seem great and convex, a huge flattened sphere with the sun high above, and not the swift curving steel ball that it actually was. This was her world. It was like Earth, like the old Earth of the legends of the time before the radiation wars. And even though her mind might know the truth about the screens that refracted light and the atomic pile that was her sun, her heart knew a more human truth. This was a world, as it had been in the beginning, as it must be till the end, or until they found a new Earth somewhere, sometime. Max sighed. Yes, you have your world, Trina, and it's a good one, the best of its kind I've ever visited. Why don't you stay here, then? A spaceman, she thought. With all the dozens of men in my world, why did it have to be a spaceman? with all the visitors from New France and New Chile and New Australia last festival. Why did it have to be him? I have the stars, Trina. We do too. Last festival and the warm June night, heavy, druggedly heavy, with honeysuckle and magnolia and the hidden music from the pavilions. And Max Kramer, tall and strong-boned and alien, holding her in his arms, dancing her away from her people, out onto the terrace above the little stream beneath the full festival moon and the summer stars, the safe, sane, well-ordered constellations that their ancestors had looked upon from Earth. My stars are real, Trina. She shook her head, unable to argue with him. World woman and spaceman, and always different, with nothing in common between them, really, except a brief forgetfulness at festival time. Come with me, Trina. No. She gathered up the reins and chucked at the horse and turned slowly for the village. You wouldn't come? For me? You wouldn't stay, would you? She heard the windmill blades whir again, and a rustling of wind, and then he was beside her, skimming slowly along, barely off the ground, making her horse snort nervously away. Trina, I shouldn't tell you this, not until we've met with your councilmen, but uh, I've got to. He wasn't smiling now. There was a wild look about his face. She didn't like it. Captain Bernard's with the council now, giving them the news. But I wanted to see you first, to be the one who told you. He broke off, shook his head. Yet when I found you, I couldn't say anything. I guess I was afraid of what you'd answer. What are you talking about? She didn't want to look at him. It embarrassed her somehow, seeing him so eager. What do you want to tell me? About our last trip, Trina. We found a world. She stared at him blankly, and his hand made a cutting gesture of impatience. Oh, not a world like this one. A planet, Trina. And it's Earth-type. She wheeled the horse about and stared at him. For a moment, she felt excitement rise inside of her, too. And then she remembered the generations of searching and the false alarms, and the dozens of barren, unfit planets that the spacemen colonized, planets like ground-bound ships. Oh, Trina, Max cried, this isn't like the others, it's a new Earth, and there are already people there, from not long after the Exodus. A new Earth, she said, I don't believe it. The Council wouldn't either, she thought. Not after all the other new Earths, freezing cold or methane atmosphered, or at best completely waterless. This would be like the others. A spaceman's dream. You've got to believe me, Trina, Max said. And you've got to help make the others believe. Don't you see? You wouldn't live in space. And I wouldn't live here, on this. But there, on a real planet, on a real Earth. Then, suddenly, she felt his excitement, and it was a part of her, until against all reason she wanted to believe in his mad dream of a world. She laughed aloud as she caught up the reins and raced her horse homeward, toward the long vista of the horizon and the capital village beyond it, ten minutes' gallop away. Max and Trina came together into the council hall, and saw the two groups, the room full of world men and the half-dozen spacemen, apart from each other, arguing. The spacemen's eyes were angry. "'A world,' Captain Bernard said bitterly. "'There for your taking, and you don't even want to look at it.' How do we know what kind of world it is? Councilman Elias leaned forward on the divan. His voice was gentle, almost pitying. You brought no samples, no vegetation, no minerals. 
Not even air samples, Aaron Gomez said softly. Why? Bernard sighed. We didn't want to wait, he said. We wanted to get back here to tell you. It may be a paradise world to you, Elias said. But to us... Max Kramer tightened his grip on Trina's hand. The fools, he said, talking and talking, and all the time this world drifts farther and farther away. It takes so much power to change course, Trina said. And besides, you feel it. It makes you heavy. She remembered the stories her father used to tell, about his own youth, when he and Kurt Elias had turned the world to go to a planet the spaceman found. A planet with people, people who lived under glass domes, or deep below the formaldehyde-poisoned surface. You could be there in two weeks, easily, even at your world speed, Captain Bernard said. And then we'd have to go out, Elias said, into space. The world men nodded. The women looked at each other and nodded too. One of the spacemen swore graphically, and there was an embarrassed silence as Trina's people pretended not to have heard. Oh, let's get out of here, the spaceman who had sworn swore again just as descriptively, and then grinned at the councilmen and their aloof blank faces. They don't want our planet. All right, maybe New Chile. Wait, Trina said it without thinking, without intending to. She stood speechless when the others turned to face her. All the others. Her people and Max's. Kurt Elias leaning forward again, smiling at her. Yes, Trina, the councilman said. Why don't we at least look at it? Maybe it is what they say. Expression came back to their faces then. They nodded at each other and looked from her to Max Kramer and back again at her, and they smiled. Festival time, their eyes said. Summer evenings, summer foolishness. And festival time long behind them, but soon to come again. Your father went to space, Elias said. We saw one of those worlds the spacemen talk of. I know. He didn't like it. I know that too, she said, remembering his bitter words and the nightmare times when her mother had had so much trouble comforting him and the winter evenings when he didn't want even to go outside and see the familiar earth-encircling stars. He was dead now. Her mother was dead now. They were not here to disapprove, to join with Elias and the others. They would have hated for her to go out there. She faltered, the excitement Max had aroused in her dying away, and then she thought of their argument, as old as their desire. She knew that if she wanted him, it would have to be away from the worlds. At least we could look, she said, and the spacemen could bring up samples, and maybe even some of the people for us to talk to. Elias nodded. It would be interesting, he said slowly, to talk to some new people. It's been so long, and we wouldn't even have to land, Aaron Gomez said, if it didn't look right. The people turned to each other again and smiled happily. She knew that they were thinking of the men and women they would see, and all the new things to talk about. We might even invite some of them up for the festival, Elias said slowly, providing they're courteous. He frowned at the young spaceman who had done the swearing, and then he looked back at Captain Burnett. And providing, of course, that we're not too far away by then. I don't think you will be, Burnett said. I think you'll stay. I think so too, Max Kramer said, moving closer to Trina. I hope so. Elias stood up slowly and signalled that the council was dismissed. The other people stood up also and moved toward the doors. We'd better see about changing the world's course, Aaron Gomez said. No one objected. It was going to be done. Trina looked up at Max Kramer and knew that she loved him and wondered why she was afraid. It was ten days later that the world, New America, came into the gravitational influence of the planet's solar system. The automatic deflectors swung into functioning position, ready to change course, slowly and imperceptibly, but enough to take the world around the system and out into the freedom of space where it could wander on its random course. But this time, men shunted aside the automatic controls. Men guided their homeland in, slowly now, 
toward the second planet from the sun, the one that the spaceman had said was so like Earth. We'll see it tomorrow, Trina said. They'll shut off part of the light tower system then. Why don't they now? Max Kramer asked her. It was just past sunset and the stars of a dozen generations ago were just beginning to wink into view. He saw Venus low on the horizon and his lips tightened, and then he looked up to where he knew the new sun must be. There was only the crescent of Earth's moon. Now, Trina said, why should they turn the screens off now? We're still so far away. We wouldn't see anything. You'd see the sun, Max said. It's quite bright, even from here. And from close up, from where the planet is, it looks just about like Earth's. Trina nodded. That's good, she said, looking over at the rose tints of the afterglow. It wouldn't seem right if it didn't. A cow lowed in the distance, and nearer the laughing voices of children rode the evening breeze. Somewhere a dog barked. Somewhere else a woman called her family home to supper. Old sounds. Older, literally, than this world. What are the people like out there? He looked at her face, eager and worried at the same time, and he smiled. You'll like them, Trina, he said. They're like, well, they're more like this than anything else. He gestured vaguely at the farmhouse lights ahead of them, at the slow walking figures of the young couples out enjoying the warm spring evening, at the old farmer leading his plough horse home along the path. They live in villages not too different from yours, and in cities, and on farms. And yet you like it there, don't you? she said. He nodded. Yes, I like it there. But you don't like it here. Why? If you don't understand by now, Trina, I can't explain. They walked on. Night came swiftly, crowding the rose and purple tints out of the western sky, closing in dark and cool and sweet-smelling about them. Ahead, a footbridge loomed up out of the shadows. There was the sound of running water, and on the bank not far from the bridge, the low murmuring of a couple of late lingering fishermen. The people live out in the open, like this, Trina said. Yes. Not underground, not under a dome. I've told you before that it's like Earth, Trina. About the same size, even. This is about the same size, too. Not really. It only looks that way. The fishermen glanced up as they passed, and then bent down over their lines again. Lucas Crossman from Trina's town, and Jake Krikorian from the Southern Hemisphere, up to visit his sister Lucienne, who had just had twins. Trina said hello to them as she passed, and found out that the twins looked just like their mother, except for Grandfather Muller's eyes, and then she turned back to Max. Do people live all over the planet? On most of it. The land sections, that is. Of course, up by the poles it's too cold. But how do they know each other? He stopped walking and stared at her, not understanding for a minute. Girls' laughter came from the bushes and the soft urging voice of one of the village boys. Max looked back at the fishermen and then down at Trina and shook his head. They don't all know each other, he said. They couldn't. She thought of New Chile, where her cousin Isabel was married last year, and New India, which would follow them soon to the planet, because Captain Bernard had been able to contact them by radio. She thought of her people, her friends, and then she remembered the spaceman's far-flung ships and the homes they burrowed deep in the rock of inhospitable worlds. She knew that he would never understand why she pitied the people of this system. I suppose we'll see them soon she said. You're going to bring some of them back up in your ship tomorrow, aren't you? He stood quietly, looking down at her. His face was shadowed in the gathering night, and his whole body was in shadow, tall and somehow alien-seeming there before her. Why wait for them to come here, Trina? he said. Come down with us, in the ship, tomorrow. Come down and see for yourself what it's like. She trembled. No, she said. And she thought of the ship, out away from the sky, not down on the planet yet, but hanging above it, with no atmosphere to break the blackness, to soften the glare of the planet's sun, to shut out the emptiness. You'd hardly know you weren't here, Trina. The air smells the same, and the weight's almost the same too, maybe a little lighter. She nodded. 
I know. If we land the world, I'll go out there. But not in the ship. All right. He sighed and let go his grip on her shoulders, and turned to start walking back the way they had come, toward the town. She thought suddenly of what he had just said, that she would hardly be able to tell the difference. It can't be so much like this, she said, or you couldn't like it, no matter what you say. Trina, his voice was harsh, you've never been out in space, so you couldn't understand. You just don't know what your world is like from outside when you're coming in. But she could picture it, a tiny planetoid shining perhaps behind its own screens, a small drifting lonely sphere of rock. She trembled again. I don't want to know, she said. Somewhere in the meadows beyond the road there was laughter, a boy and a girl laughing together, happy in the night. Trina's fingers tightened on Max's hand and she pulled him around to face her, and then clung to him, trembling, feeling the nearness of him as she held up her face to be kissed. He held her to him, and slowly the outside world of space faded, and her world seemed big and solid and sure, and in his arms it was almost like festival time again. At noon the next day, the world slowed again and changed course, going into an orbit around the planet, becoming a third moon, nearer to the surface than the others. The people, all of those who had followed their normal day-to-day -day life even after New America came into the system, abandoned it at last. They crowded near the television towers, waiting for the signal which would open up some of the sky and show them the planet they circled, a great green disk twice the apparent diameter of the legendary moon of Earth. Max stood beside Trina in the crowd that pressed close about his ship. He wore his spaceman's suit, and the helmet was in his hand. Soon he too would be aboard with the others, going down to the planet. You're sure you won't come, Trina? We'll be down in a couple of hours. I'll wait until we land there, if we do. Kurt Elias came toward them through the crowd. When he saw Trina, he smiled and walked faster, almost briskly. It was strange to see him move like a young and active man. If I were younger, he said, I'd go down there. He smiled again and pointed up at the zenith, where the blue was beginning to waver and fade as the sky screen slipped away. This brings back memories. You didn't like that other world, Trina said, not any more than father did. The air was bad there, Elias said. The signal buzzer sounded again. The centre screens came down. Above them, outlined by the fuzzy halo of the still remaining sky, the black of space stood forth, and the stars and the great disk of the planet, with its seas and continents and cloud masses, and the shadow of night creeping across it from the east. "'You see, Trina?' Max said softly. The voices of the people rose, some alive with interest and others anxious, fighting back the planet and the unfamiliar two bright stars. Trina clutched Max Kramer's hand, feeling again the eagerness of that first day when he had come to tell her of this world. You're right, she whispered. It is like Earth. It was so much like the pictures, though of course the continents were different, and the seas, and instead of one moon there were two. Earth. A new Earth, there above them in the sky. Elias let out his breath slowly. Yes, he said, it is. It's not a bit like that world we visited. Not a bit. When you're down there it's even more like Earth, Max said, and all the way down you could watch it grow larger. It wouldn't be at all like open space. At the poles of the planet snow gleamed and cloud masses drifted across the equator, and the people looked and pointed their voices growing loud with eagerness. "'Why don't we land the world now?' Trina cried. "'Why wait for the ship to bring people up here?' "'Landing the world would take a lot of power,' Elias said. "'It would be foolish to do it unless we planned on staying for quite a while,' he sighed. "'Though I would like to go down there. I'd like to see a really Earth-type planet.' He looked at Max, and Max smiled. "'Well, why not?' he said. Elias smiled too. After all, I've been in space once. I'll go again. He turned and pushed his way through the people. Trina watched him go. Somehow he seemed a symbol to her. Old and stable, 
he had been head of the council since she was a child, and he had gone into space with her father. Please come, Trina, Max said. There's nothing to be afraid of. With both Max and Elias along, certainly it couldn't be too bad. Max was right. There was nothing really to be afraid of. She smiled up at him. All right, she said. I'll go. And then she was walking with Max Kramer toward the ship, and trying not to remember her father crying in his sleep. The ship rose, and Trina cried out as she felt the heaviness wrench her back against the cushions. Max reached over to her. She felt the needle go into her arm again, and then sank back into the half-sleep that he had promised would last until they were ready to land. When she awoke, the planet was a disk no longer, but a great curving mass beneath the ship, with the mountains and valleys and towns of its people plainly visible. But the planet's sky still lay below, and around them, in every direction except down, space stretched out, blacker than any night on the world. The world. Trina moaned and closed her eyes, glad she hadn't seen it somewhere tiny and insignificant behind them. Max heard her moan and reached toward her. She slept again, and woke only when they were down and he was tugging the straps loose from around her. She sat up, still numbed by the drug still half asleep and unreal feeling, and looked about her at the planet's surface. They were in a field of some sort of grain. Beyond the scorched land where they had come down, the tall cereal grasses rippled in the soft wind, a great undulating sea of green reaching out toward the far-off hills and the horizon. Cloud shadows drifted across the fields, and the shadow of the ship reached out to meet them. Trina rubbed her eyes in wonder. It is like the world, she said. Just like it. For a moment she was sure that they were back on the world again, in some momentarily unrecognized pasture, or perhaps on one of the sister worlds. Then, looking along the row of hills to where they dropped away into an extension of the plain, she saw that the horizon was a little too far, and that the light shimmered differently, somehow, than on her home. But it was such a little difference. Come on outside, Max Kramer said. You'll be all right now. She stood up and followed him. Elias was already at the airlock, moving unsteadily and a little blankly, also still partly under the influence of the narcotic. The lock opened. Captain Bernard stepped out and went down the ladder to the ground. The others followed him. Within a few minutes, the ship stood empty. Trina breathed the open air of the planet and felt the warmth on her face and smelled the scent of grass and the elusive fragrance of alien flowers. She heard the song of some strange, infinitely sweet-throated bird. It's... it's Earth, she whispered. Voices, eager calling voices, sang out in the distance. Then little cars rolled toward them, through the field, mowing down the grass, cutting themselves a path to the ship. People, men and women and children, were calling greetings. This is where we landed before, Max said. We told them we'd be back. They were sun-bronzed country people, and except for their strange clothing, they might have been from any of the worlds. Even their language was the same, though accented differently, with some of the old, unused words, like those in the legends. You've brought your people, the tall man who stood in the forefront said to Captain Bernard. They're up there, Bernard pointed up at the sky, and the people looked up. Trina looked up too. One of the planet's moons was almost full overhead. But the world was invisible, shut off by the sky and the clouds and the light of the Earth-like sun. They'd like some of you to come visit their world, Bernard said, if any of you are willing. The tall man nodded. Everyone will want to go, he said. Very few ships ever land here. Until you came, it had been years. You'd go out in space, Trina said incredulously. Again the man nodded. I was a spaceman once, he said. All of us MacGregors were. Then he sighed. Sometimes even now I want to go out again. But there have been no ships here, not for years. Trina looked past him at the women and the children, at the lush fields and the little houses far in the distance. You'd leave this? McGregor shook his head. No, of course not. Not to live in space permanently. I'd always come back. 
It's a fine world to come back to, Max said, and he and the tall man smiled at each other, as if they shared something that Trina couldn't possibly understand. We might as well go into town, McGregor said. They walked over to the cars. McGregor stopped beside one of them, his hand on the door button. Here, let me drive. The girl stepped forward out of the crowd as she spoke. She was tall, almost as tall as McGregor, and she had the same high cheekbones and the same laughter lines about her eyes. Not this time, Sari, McGregor said. This time you can entertain our guests. He turned to Max and Trina and smiled. My daughter. His face was proud. They climbed in, Trina wedging herself into the middle of the back seat between Max and the planet girl. The car throbbed into motion, then picked up speed, jolting a bit on the rough country road. The ground rushed past and the fields rushed past, and Trina leaned against Max and shut her eyes against the dizzying speed. Here, close to the ground, so close that they could feel every unevenness of its surface, it was far worse than in the windmill-like craft the spacemen used on the worlds. "'Don't you have cars?' Sari asked. "'No,' Trina said. "'We don't need them.' A car like this would rush all the way around the world in half an hour. In a car like this one, even the horizons wouldn't look right, rushing to meet them. Here, though, the horizons stayed the same, unmoving while the fence posts and the farmhouses and the people flashed past. "'What do you use for transportation, then?' "'We walk,' Trina said, opening her eyes to look at the girl, and then closing them again. "'Or we ride horses. Or—' A few minutes later, the car slowed, and Trina opened her eyes again. "'We're coming into town.' Sari said. They had climbed up over the brow of a small hill, and were now dropping down. At the bottom of the hill the houses clumped together, sparsely at first, then more and more of them so that the whole valley was filled with buildings, and more buildings hugged the far slopes. "'There are so many of them,' Trina whispered. "'Oh no, Trina, this is just a small town. But the people, all those people—' They crowded the streets, watching the cars come in, looking with open curiosity at their alien visitors. Faces, a thousand faces, all different and yet somehow all alike, blended together into a great anonymous mass. "'There aren't half that many people on the whole world,' Trina said. Sari smiled. "'Just wait till you see the city!' Trina shook her head and looked up at Max. He was smiling out of the town, nodding to some men he apparently knew with nothing but eagerness in his face. He seemed a stranger. She looked around for Kurt Elias, but he was in one of the other cars cut off from them by the crowd. She couldn't see him at all. "'Don't you like it?' Sari said. "'I liked it better where we landed.' Max turned and glanced down at her briefly, but his hand found hers and held it tightly, until her own relaxed. "'If you want to, Trina, we can live out there, in those fields.' For a moment she forgot the crowd and the endless faces as she looked up at him. Do you mean that, Max? We could really live out there? Where it was quiet, and the sun was the same, and the birds sang sweetly just before harvest time, where she would have room to ride and plenty of pasture for her favourite horse, where she would have Max there with her, not out somewhere beyond the stars. Certainly we could live there, he said. That's what I've been saying all along. You could settle down here? He laughed. Oh, I suppose I'd be out in space a good deal of the time, he said. The ships will come here now, you know. But I'll always come home, Trina. To this world. To you. And suddenly it didn't matter that the girl beside her chuckled, nor that there were too many people crowding round them, all talking at once in their strangely accented voices. All that mattered was Max, and this world, which was real after all and a life that seemed like an endless festival time before her. Evening came quickly, too quickly, with the sun dropping in an unnatural plunge toward the horizon. Shadows crept out from the houses of the town, reached across the narrow street and blended with the walls of the houses opposite. The birds sang louder in the twilight, the notes of their song drifting in from the nearby fields. And there was another sound, that of the wind, not loud now, but rising, swirling fingers of dust in the street. Trina sat in front of the town café with the planet girl Sari. 
Max Kramer was only a few feet away, but he paid no attention to her, and little to Elias. He was too busy telling the planet people about space. Your man? Sari asked. Yes, Trina said. I guess so. You're lucky. Sari looked over at Max and sighed, and then she turned back to Trina. My father was a spaceman. He used to take my mother up when they were first married, when the ships were still running. She sighed. I remember the ships, a little, but it was such a long time ago. I can't understand you people, Trina shook her head, leaving all of this just to go out in space. The room was crowded, oppressively crowded. Outside too many people walked the shadowed streets, too many voices babbled together. The people of this planet must be a little mad, Trina thought, to live cooped together as the spacemen lived, with all their world around them. Sari sat watching her and nodded. You're different, aren't you? From us and from them, too. She looked over at Max and Bernard and the others, and then she looked at Kurt Elias, who sat clenching and unclenching his hands, saying nothing. Yes, we're different, Trina said. Max Kramer's voice broke incisively into the silence that lay between them then. I don't see why, he said, we didn't all know about this world, especially if more than one ship came here. Sari's father laughed softly. It's not so strange. The ships all belong to one clan, the McGregors, and eventually all of them either were lost in space somewhere or else grew tired of roaming around and settled down. Here. He smiled again, and his high-cheekboned face leaned forward into the light. Like me. Night. Cloudless, black, but hazed over with atmosphere, and thus familiar, not like the night of space. The two small moons, the stars in unfamiliar places, and somewhere, a star that was her world. And Trina sat and listened to the planet men talk, and to the spacemen among them who could no longer be distinguished from the native-born. Outside, in the narrow street, wind murmured, scudding papers and brush before it, vague shadows against the light houses. Wind rising and moaning, the sound coming in over the voices and the music from the café singers. It was a stronger wind than ever blew on the world, even during the winter, when the people had to stay inside and wish that earth tradition might be broken and good weather be had the year round. We'd better get back to the ship, Elias said. They stopped talking and looked at him, and he looked down at his hands, embarrassed. They'll be worried about us at home. No, they won't, Max said. Then he saw the thin, blue-veined hands trembling, and the quiver not quite controlled in the wrinkled neck. Though perhaps we should start back. Trina let out her breath in relief. To be back in the ship, she thought, with the needle in its forgetfulness, away from the noise and the crowd and the nervousness brought on by the rising wind. It would be better, of course, when they had their place in the country. There it would be warm and homelike and quiet, with the farm animals nearby and the weather shut out, boarded out and forgotten, the way it was in winter on the world. "'You're coming with us?' Captain Bernard was saying. "'Yes, we're coming.' Half a dozen of the men stood up and began pulling on their long, awkward coats. "'It'll be good to get back in space again,' McGregor said. "'For a while,' he smiled. "'But I'm too old for a spaceman's life now.' "'And I'm too old even for this,' Elias said apologetically. "'If we'd found this planet the other time—' He sighed and shook his head and looked out the window at the shadows that were people, bent forward, walking into the wind. He sighed again. I don't know. I just don't know. Sari got up and pulled on her wrap too. Then she walked over to one of the other women, spoke to her a minute, and came back carrying a quilted, rough-fabriced coat. Here, Trina, you'd better put this on. It'll be cold out. Are you going with us? Sure, why not? Dad's talked enough about space. I might as well see what it's like for myself. Trina shook her head, but before she could speak, Someone opened the door, and the cold breeze came in, hitting her in the face. "'Come on,' Sari said. "'It'll be warm in the car.' Somehow she was outside, following the others. The wind whipped her hair, stung her eyes, tore at her legs. The coat kept it from her body, but she couldn't protect her face, nor shut out the low moaning wail of it through the trees and the housetops. 
she groped her way into the car. The door slammed shut, and the wind retreated a little. Is it... is it often like that? Sari McGregor looked at her. Max Kramer turned and looked at her, and so did the others in the car. For a long moment, no one said anything. And then Sari said, Why, this is summer, Trina. Summer? She thought of the cereal grasses rippling in the warm day. They'd be whipping in the wind now, of course. The wind that was so much stronger than any the world's machines ever made. You ought to be here in winter, Sari was saying. It really blows then. And there are the rainstorms and snow. Snow, Trina said blankly. Certainly, a couple of feet of it usually. Sari stopped talking and looked at Trina, and surprise crept even farther into her face. You mean you don't have snow on your world? Why, yes, we have snow. We have everything Earth had. But snow two feet deep? Trina shivered, thinking of winter on the world, and the soft dusting of white on winter mornings, the beautiful powdery flakes cool in the sunlight. They have about a sixteenth of an inch of it, Max said, and even that's more than some of the worlds have. It hardly ever even rains in New California. Sari turned away finally, and the others did too. The car started, the sound of its motors shutting out the wind a little, and then they were moving. Yet it was even more frightening, rushing over the roads in the darkness, with the houses flashing past, and the trees thrashing in the wind, and the people briefly seen and then left behind in the night. The ship was ahead. The ship. Now even it seemed a safe, familiar place. This isn't like Earth after all, Trina said bitterly, and it seemed so beautiful at first. Then she saw that Sari McGregor was looking at her again, but this time more in pity than in surprise. Not like Earth, Trina. You're wrong. We have a better climate than Earth's. We never have blizzards nor hurricanes, and it's never too cold nor too hot, really. How can you say that? Trina cried. We've kept our world like Earth. Oh, maybe we've shortened winter a little, but still. Sari's voice was sad and gentle, as if she were explaining something to a bewildered child. My mother's ancestors came here only a few years out from Earth, she said. And do you know what they called this planet? A paradise. A garden world. That's why they named it Eden, Max Kramer said. Then they were at the ship, out of the car, running to the airlock, with the grass lashing at their legs, and the wind lashing at their faces, and the cold night air aflame suddenly in their lungs. And Trina couldn't protest any longer, not with the world mad about her, not with Sari's words ringing in her ears like the wind. She saw them carry Kurt Elias in, and then Max was helping her aboard, and a moment later, finally, the airlock doors slipped shut, and it was quiet. She held out her arm for the needle. When she awoke again, it was morning. Morning on the world. They had carried her to one of the divans in the council hall, one near a window, so that she could see the familiar fields of her homeland as soon as she awoke. She rubbed her eyes and straightened, and looked up at the others. At Elias, still resting on another divan. At Captain Bernard. At Sari and her father, and another man from the planet. At Max. He looked at her, and then sighed and turned away, shaking his head. Are we... are we going back there? Trina asked. No, Elias said. The people are against it. There was silence for a moment, and then Elias went on. I'm against it. I suppose that even if I'd been young I wouldn't have wanted to stay. His eyes met Trina's, and there was pity in them. No, Max said. You wouldn't have wanted to. And yet, Elias said, I went down there. Trina went down there. Her father and I both went out into space. He sighed. The others wouldn't even do that. You're not quite as bad, that's all, Max said bluntly. But I don't understand any of you. None of us ever has understood you. None of us ever will. Trina looked across at him. Her fingers knew every line of his face, but now he was withdrawn, a stranger. You're going back there, aren't you? she said. And when he nodded, she sighed. We'll never understand you either, I guess. She remembered Sari's question of the night before. Is he your man? And she realized that her answer had not been the truth. 
She knew now that he had never been hers, not really, nor she his, that the woman who would be his would be like Sari, eager and unafraid and laughing in the wind, or looking up the ports at friendly stars. Elias leaned forward on the divan and gestured toward the master weather panel for their part of the village, the indicators that told what it was like today and what it would be like tomorrow all over the world. I think I understand, he said. I think I know what we did to our environment, through the generations. But it doesn't do much good, just knowing something. You'll never change, Max said. No, I don't think we will. Captain Bernard got up, and McGregor got up too. They looked at Max. Slowly he turned his head and smiled at Trina, and then he too stood up. Want to come outside and talk, Trina? But there was nothing to say. Nothing she could do except break down and cry in his arms and beg him not to leave her, beg him to spend the rest of his life on a world she could never leave again. No, she said. I guess not. And then the memories rushed back, and the music and the little lane down by the stream where the magnolias spread their web of fragrance. It's... it's almost festival time, Max. Will you be here for it? I don't know, Trina. It meant no. She knew that. The week slipped by, until it was summer on the world, until the festival music sang through the villages, and the festival flowers bloomed, and the festival lovers slipped off from the dances to walk among them. There was a breeze, just enough to carry the mingled fragrances and the mingled songs, just enough to touch the throat and ruffle the hair and lie lightly between the lips of lovers. Trina danced with Aaron Gomez, and remembered. And the wind seemed too soft somehow, almost lifeless, with the air too sweet and cloying. She wondered what a festival on the planet would be like. Max, with Sari McGregor, perhaps, laughing in the wind, running in the chill of evening along some river bank. I could have gone with him, she thought. I could have gone. But then the music swirled faster about them, the pulse of it pounding in her ears, and Aaron swept her closer as they danced, spinning among the people and the laughter, out toward the terrace, toward the trees with leaves unstirring in the evening air. All was colour and sound and scent, all blended, hypnotically perfect, something infinitely precious that she could never, never leave. For it was summer on the world, and festival time again. The Pure Observers by B. J. Rogers Narrated by William Skye The history of spaceflight begins before man. While our planet still lay wrapped in its dream of isolation, other intelligences watched from above, minds pure, undying, noble, and pathetically vulnerable. Oh, he is dead, my mind cried out. Novna, my dear, I am writing this as a release for my conscience. Those things which trouble me are not such as one exchanges with vigil companions, or indeed with anyone not bound by ties like ours. If I were at home with you, I would exchange with your soul in a moment the feeling of my own, but distance permits no such consolation, and it is not suitable for me to exchange so familiarly with my colleagues. I find myself questioning the value of our customary refusal to communicate thoughts of a delicate and sensitive nature. The earth people, who speak their thoughts, perhaps are less primitive than we like to imagine. They seem to have no sense of the danger of overwhelming the soul of another with unwanted confidences. The purely vocal nature of their communication does not admit an excessive degree of emotion to their relationships. They do not have to erect any artificial barriers between each other, as we must who exchange on a mental level. These doubts of mine never could have arisen if we men of Hynos had not presumed to observe the alien ways of those creatures on the third earth, so like ourselves and yet so remote, though we have hovered above them listening and watching for twelve of their generations. 
This vigil, though it is to last but one journey around the sun, has seemed longer and less fruitful than all the others. I think I shall not come again, but leave such work to those who can remain efficient and disinterested observers, unmoved by doubt and anxiety. Novna, you must begin to think what we two shall do with the rest of our eternity, for now that I have spent some small portion of mine in fifty vigils, I find they have become distasteful. We might go to the Palace of Art and study to be poet-priests. My last vigil has convinced me that I am more fitted for that life than this. When our mission left Hynos for the Third Earth, there was aboard our ship the poet-priest Gven. You must remember the many nights we sat beneath the rocks by the ocean, listening as his soul gave ours his songs. Innocent they were, and filled with talk of purity and light, though Gven is as old as the rest of us, even if he is as different from you and me as the Earth Child is from its parents. You have never seen him, I think. He is smaller than I, slight of build and tender-faced. How out of place he looked among the ship's sturdy men of science, with their ages of discipline and austerity written indelibly into their features. They did not want him. They told the Commissioner that they did not want him. Let him stay at home, they said, and sing his songs to those who wish to listen. But the Commissioner himself, and I suspect the Commissioner's wife, was as fond as any of Gven and his songs, so he said Gven was to come if he liked. Poor Gven tried hard enough to make us like him. He offered us the only gift he had, that of his songs, but no one cared to hear them except me, and I was ashamed to say so. In the end he was reduced to sitting for hours looking out into the night through which the ship bore us, saying nothing to anyone for fear of our scorn. He would have liked us to tell him about the earth people, for his studies at the palace fitted him sadly for a scientific expedition. Of the earth people, however, we hesitated to speak freely, even among ourselves, for all of us feel strongly about them, in one way or another. Our exchanges on the matter have always been burdened with emotion, and we find we cannot share easily our thoughts about earth people unless we banter lightly and say little of what we really feel. When our long ship drew near the third earth, we were transferred into the round ship in which we were to carry on our observations. I could see Gven was limp with excitement, but as always I would not exchange with him for fear of the others, not even to drain off that excess of feeling which was to prove so dangerous to him. Perhaps he thought it would be different once we had established ourselves in our designated area of observation. Then we might warm toward him, giving him the comforts of our experience. If such were his expectations, he was disappointed. Whatever he gathered from us was purely accidental, information that we exchanged among ourselves as we worked. Only in this way did he learn of those few bonds we had forged with the Earth people. It is our custom, as you know, for each man to select one of the Earth people as his subject. This is not part of our work, it is only a device to drive away the tedium that descends upon men far from home and bound to exacting work in a confined place. We begin to feel quite passionately concerned with our subjects, and occasionally find it difficult to return to our primary concerns. For some time I had been spending my free hours in the world of a gentle old merchant named Jacobs. I lived his life with him briefly, seeing his wife and children as he saw them, going with him to his store. His memories were good ones, filled with hard work and simple pleasures. One day, when I had left the computing tables to prepare for dinner, I saw the mind of Jacobs. He was crossing the street, and as he turned his head, he saw the shining lights of an automobile just before it struck him. I withdrew from his mind in a shower of pain and darkness. "'Oh, he is dead!' my mind cried out to my vigil companions before I could smother the shock and emotion in it. They looked up at me, questioning. Then I exchanged with them more coolly. My man Jacobs has been killed crossing the street. Kevin, the fuel technician, reached my mind first. A pity. I lost a subject myself that way not long ago. It is a bad death for them, poor things. They might build overpasses, mightn't they? A pity. 
It has never failed to unsettle me the way my companions have come to accept the idea of death so easily. To me it is always a horror, unnatural and alien. You cannot quite see how it is, Novna, for you have never been in the mind of one who dies. I withdrew for a little while to mourn my man Jacobs, for my sorrow was not to be shared with the others. It was while I sat thinking of dead Jacobs that Gwen approached hesitantly and sat near me. Is it possible, he asked, that one can read the soul of an earthman? Could I? Or perhaps that would not be permitted to me? His eagerness made me ashamed of the silence I had maintained between us. It is certainly possible for you to try, though it cannot always be done. You need ask no one for permission. The delight in his eyes made me forget Jacobs a little. I may try any one at all? I advise you to search about a little. Don't seize on the first one you contact as a subject. You have less time than the rest of us for this sort of thing. Gven thanked me shyly and went away. Later I saw him sitting at the open panels looking down at the cloud-topped mountains and sandy valleys over which we circled. His face was still and pale as he concentrated. The next day at dinner, Gven sat playing with his food, looking up at the rest of us frequently, as if his fear of our coldness were contending with his wish to open his mind to us. I was not the only one to notice his excitement, but the rest sat looking at their plates stonily. They liked Gven even less than they had at first, and preferred to ignore his presence altogether. At last I lifted my head defiantly, and my thoughts streamed across the table into the mind of Gven with such energy and violence that the others raised their eyes from their food in quick surprise. It must be that you have found a subject. I should like to hear about it. At once Gven let his thoughts explode in undisciplined profusion. The men drew back a little, shocked by the unfamiliar impact of another's passion on their minds. The very first mind I sought was that of a girl who calls herself Maria Dolores. Often her mind turns in upon itself, and she reflects like this. Maria Dolores, you have behaved badly to your papa today. Now you must go and ask him to forgive you and give him a kiss. In this way she scolds herself for small misdemeanors. Her world is composed of happy, innocent trivialities, though as her purity touches on them and causes them to glow briefly before they are left behind, it seems that there are no more divine and lovely things in existence than those in the world of my Maria Dolores. Gwen blushed and paused for a moment, then rushed on. I sense that her father and mother have barricaded her from everyone else. They are strict with Maria Dolores, and sometimes she wishes she could go out to dances as the other girls do. But she is not sad for long, and goes to gather flowers for the dinner table. She sets them in long silver dishes that reflect the pink and red glow of the sunset slanting through the window. This pleases Maria Dolores, and she stands watching for a long time. Gwen would have said more, but all at once Corvin, the cultural researcher, interrupted, looking at me. Norvin, what have you brought upon us by your curiosity? We are being buried in an avalanche of poetic fancies. After this, Gwen sat silent, his face burning, and the rest of us began to talk of the relation between the sites of mines and the locations of proving grounds. For many days I watched Gwen covertly. He no longer seemed to care about our rebuffs, nor did he show any desire to ask us questions. He only sat by the panels, his expression withdrawn and intent, while the rest of us hustled busily and a little self-consciously around him. I came to notice a certain perplexity in his face after a time, and felt that I should ask if he needed any assistance. But I was awkward and unsure of myself, so I only watched him and said nothing. At last he came to me, having built up a powerful reserve of feeling that overflowed with the more violence for having been repressed so long. "'There is something that is to happen in the life of my Maria Dolores,' Gwen began directly. Unaccountably, I tensed and tried to suppress the warmth I felt toward him. "'Well, what is it, then?' I answered. He seemed not to notice the strain I was under. 
they have told her she is to be married to a young man whom they have chosen for her. She is unhappy, but cannot tell them. Now they are making many preparations. Maria Dolores spends her time with her mother, sewing dresses and packing them away. Then her mother speaks to her of things that frighten her and me, things that seem to happen when men and women are alone at night. She does not understand, and lies awake when her mother has gone, afraid and wondering. We are uneasy, Maria Dolores and I. Here, Novna, I must attempt to explain the marriage of earth people. While with us marriage is the spiritualized union of masculine and feminine natures in one soul, it is to them a more concrete thing. Their junction is not only one of minds, but one of bodies as well. The union seems not to be unpleasant for those who take part in it, but for us, who so jealously guard our bodies from another's touch, the marriage of earth people is difficult to contemplate without revulsion. I was rescued from having to answer Gven by the laughter of Corvan, who had overheard the last of the poet's words. Well then, poet, if she is unhappy, you must take her away, mustn't you? That's what you want, it seems, to take her away to Hynos and make her your Gvna. Gven stood up and glared angrily at Corvin. Would it be so bad a thing to carry back one person of Earth? Why shouldn't we? He flung at the other man. Corvin turned away in disgust. You know we have no authority to intervene in their affairs. This is what comes of letting a poet-priest meddle in the concerns of science. A sullenness came over Gven's face, and he withdrew from us again, turning back to the panels. I knew he was with Maria Dolores. Though I was uneasy over his ignorance, I could not help feeling relieved that I had not been forced to enlighten him. My anxiety proved to be well founded. It was only a few weeks later that we reaped the results of our long cultivated conspiracy of silence against the poet priest. We were deeply engrossed in our work at the computing tables when our nerves were shattered by a cry of anguish from the mind of Gven. In a moment we were standing around him, avoiding each other's eyes and scarcely daring to look at the man shuddering before us, his face in his hands. It is done. Gven cast his anger at us like a stone. It is as though she had been killed. Why couldn't you tell me? You, Noven, I asked you. Why couldn't you have spared me this? The men looked uneasily at me and back at Gven. Shaken, they drifted away, back to their work, still ashamed to meet each other's eyes. Gven sat there, grinding his fist into his palm, staring straight ahead. He has been gone for some time now. At his request, a longship stopped for him on its homeward cruise. I have not tried to reach another subject, nor have any of the others. At least, if they have, they do not speak of it. We are reluctant to attempt any communion with these creatures whose alien nature has been so strikingly demonstrated to us. The game of observation itself has become less a game, and we go about our work with a vague sense of unrest as though the descent of catastrophe upon us were imminent. Gven gave us one last gift before he left. He sang us a song that made us want to bend our heads to the ground in shame. If his songs are bitter now, and if there is no innocence in them, one needs not look far to find the reason. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed the stories, hit the like button and subscribe for more every Monday and Friday. And remember to take a look at my Patreon if you'd like to support the channel further. Or staying on YouTube, you might like my compilation of five somber and perturbing sci-fi short stories. A link to that video is on screen now.